This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Winterer, and I'm the director of the Stanford Humanities Center. And we're very delighted that you can join us this evening for the Raymond F. West Memorial Lecture. This lecture series was established in 1910 by Mr. and Mrs. Frederick West of Seattle in memory of their son, a student at Stanford University. The goal of these lectures is to promote the subject of immortality, human conduct, and human destiny. And I think we can all agree that the topic of this evening's lecture, Why Worry About Future Generations, fits beautifully into the spirit of the West's generous bequest. This year, the West Lecture has been co-sponsored with the McCoy Family Center for Ethics in Society, and we're grateful to professors Deborah Satz and Rob Reich, the directors of that center, for joining us this year to support this event, and to Joan Berry, the executive director of that center, for logistical support. Tonight's lecture will go until about 7 o'clock, at which point we will take questions from you, the audience, and we will conclude promptly at 7.30 p.m. We'll be circulating microphones around the room. Um, please ask only one question, and please frame any comments in the form of a question. <laughs> It's a great pleasure now to introduce Professor Samuel Scheffler, University Professor of Philosophy and Law in the Department of Philosophy at New York University, where he arrived in 2008 after teaching on the faculty at UC Berkeley since 1977. Professor Scheffler received his BA from Harvard University and his PhD from Princeton. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been a recipient of Guggenheim and NEH fellowships. In a wide-ranging body of work, Professor Scheffler has focused in particular on the areas of political and moral philosophy. His many publications include five books, beginning with the highly acclaimed Rejection of Consequentialism, published in 1982, with a revised edition published in 1994, Human Morality from 1992, Boundaries and Allegiances in 2001, Equality and Tradition in 2010, and very recently, Death and the Afterlife. The ideas in his most recent book, Death and the Afterlife, are some of the springboards for his talk with us today. In a nutshell, here is the problem. We are all going to die, not tonight, and the world will go on without us. These very obvious facts stare us in the face every day, and yet like the air we breathe, we don't often notice them. This collective afterlife, as Professor Scheffler calls it, is enormously important to us, but we ignore it because we take it so much for granted. The value of much of what we do in the present is contingent upon our believing that people whom we neither know nor love will exist far into the future, many years after we and all the people we love have died. Our values are thus embedded in a belief not only that humanity has stretched far into the past, but it, that it will stretch far into the future. The distant future has a moral claim on those of us walking the earth today. Before I hand you off to Professor Scheffler, I would like to share with you three marvelous sentences that he has written in his essay, The Normativity of Tradition. I quote them to you tonight because they are so very much in the spirit of Raymond West's lectures, emphasis on immortality and human destiny, and the great value of the humanities in preserving what our culture most needs for the future. Traditions, he writes, are human practices whose organizing purpose is to preserve what is valued beyond the lifespan of any single individual or generation. They are collaborative, multi-generational enterprises devised by human beings precisely to satisfy the deep human impulse to preserve what is valued. 
In subscribing to a tradition, one seeks to ensure the survival over time of what one values. And in seeking to ensure the survival over time of what one values, one diminishes the perceived significance of one's own death. I would love to put that on the website of the Stanford Humanities Center. Please join me in welcoming Professor Samuel Scheffler. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, and thank you for the invitation to deliver the West Lecture. It's a great honor. <clears throat> uh, in this lecture, I want to explore, in a frankly speculative spirit, some questions about our attitudes toward future generations. I hope you'll excuse the speculative character of my remarks. The questions I want to consider are large and difficult to think about, but they're important and perhaps even urgent, and I don't believe they've received as much attention from philosophers, at least, as they deserve. With the notable exceptions of Burkean conservatives and the adherents of some religious traditions, those of us who live in contemporary liberal societies lack a rich set of evaluative resources for thinking about the human beings who will come after us. We don't have a highly developed set of ideas about the value of human continuity, or about the values we hope will be realized in the future, or about the values and norms that should inform our own activities insofar as they affect future generations or depend on the expectation that there will be future generations. People's hopes or fears about the fate of their own personal descendants, primarily their children and grandchildren, constitute a partial exception to this generalization, but even these hopes and fears are usually fairly vague and inchoate. They're often limited to a general desire that things will go well for their descendants and an anxiety that they won't. Beyond that, many people are uneasy about the impact of our way of life on future generations, and there are the familiar ritualized declarations by public officials about our responsibilities to those who come after us. These declarations are sometimes transparently opportunistic, but even when they're sincere, they rarely spell out the content of the alleged responsibilities in a clear and convincing way. To some extent, the poverty of our evaluative discourse about the human future is matched by the poverty, poverty of our discourse about the human past. It's not just that levels of historical literacy are low. Perhaps that has always been true. It's also that, in recent times, a number of intellectual tendencies have combined to erode our disposition to look back on our forebears with reverence or piety, or to see them as setting standards to which we're bound by ideals of loyalty or honor to adhere. Among these intellectual tendencies, I would include tendencies toward individualism and religious skepticism, as well as an increased appreciation of cultural diversity, and a simultaneous discomfort about the moral ambiguity of national and ethnic affiliations. These tendencies have helped to undermine earlier conceptions of the normative significance of the past, and we've not yet developed another set of concepts and attitudes to replace those whose grip on us has loosened. There's an interesting contrast, I think, between the way we think about temporal periods other than our own and the way we think about regions of the earth other than our own. Globalization and global integration are among the great buzzwords of our age. It's a familiar fact that technological advances have facilitated dramatic increases in global travel and communication, and in so doing have made possible social and economic interaction across national borders on an unprecedented scale. This in turn has had far-reaching effects on the way that many people understand the social world and their own place in it and it has created increasing pressure to develop transnational norms and institutions to structure and regulate global travel, communications, commerce, finance, and so on. So we've seen a rapidly growing interest, both within the academy and outside it, in what might be called global normativity, in topics like cosmopolitanism, global justice, human rights, and international law. Yet even as we're becoming, so to speak, geographically more cosmopolitan, we've become temporally more parochial, 
more firmly rooted in our own time, less linked by conceptions of value to those who came before us and those who will come after us. We talk a great deal about global or international integration, but not much about temporal or intergenerational integration. Our awareness of the multiple interconnections among people in different parts of the world continues to expand, but our sense of the connections among different human generations has become increasingly impoverished as compared, say, with more traditional societies, which often had rich and vivid conceptions of the importance of ancestors and descendants and of the continuity of the generations. These changes have not taken place overnight. More than 70 years ago, T.S. Eliot described the emergence of what he regarded as a new kind of provincialism, the provincialism, he said, not of space, but of time. Eliot was a cultural conservative, and his primary concern in speaking of the provincialism of time was with what he saw as his contemporaries' inadequate appreciation of the values and standards of the past. But it's possible to interpret the attitudes that elicited his concern as early symptoms of the more general phenomenon that I'm calling our temporal parochialism, which includes our attitudes both toward the past and toward the future. I think that many people are uneasy about our temporal parochialism. As evidence, I would cite, with respect to our attitudes toward the past, the enormous interest in genealogy and the tracing of one's personal ancestry. And with respect to our attitudes toward the future, I would cite the large and ever-growing body of apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic literature and film. I interpret these phenomena as manifestations of uneasiness, which serve to confirm the absence of any confident or untroubled or normatively articulate understanding of our place in time or our relations to people living at other times. The same uneasiness helps to explain why issues of public policy that implicate our attitudes toward the past or the future, issues ranging from the teaching of history to the problem of climate change, frequently elicit passionate debate and generate intense controversy. I take all of these phenomena to indicate that our temporal parochialism, as I'm calling it, is only part of the story. It may be true that, as compared with more traditional and more religious societies, we have an evaluatively impoverished understanding of the connections among the generations. Yet we're hardly uninterested in our relations to our predecessors and successors, and the very poverty of our evaluative thought about our place in the chain of generations is experienced by many people as a form of privation. It's interesting to speculate as to why our geographical cosmopolitanism should be increasing even as its temporal analog has been declining, but I won't pursue that question here. Nor will I have anything further to say about our attitudes toward our predecessors or toward the past more generally. Those topics are very rich, but they're topics for another day. My concern in this lecture will be exclusively with our attitudes toward future generations. As I've noted, one urgent matter of public concern that implicates those attitudes is the topic of climate change. The dominant view among those who have seriously considered the question is that climate change poses a grave threat to our planet and to human life in particular. And although experts disagree about exactly how costly it will be for us to take effective action to minimize or mitigate the impact of climate change, by most accounts, the costs are likely to be significant. Suppose that is so. And suppose that failure to take such action will allow processes to unfold that will have drastic and potentially devastating effects on the lives of those who come after us. Some of the effects of climate change are already apparent. And in the absence of concerted action, more dramatic effects will be felt during our lifetimes. But the effects on people who come after us will be more devastating still. And eventually, the Earth may become uninhabitable by humans. Indeed, on the day that I wrote, that I wrote these words, the New York Times cited unnamed scientists as saying the Earth could become uninhabitable by the end of the century. If that's right, then we're faced with a choice. We must decide what costs we're willing to bear and how far we're willing to alter our lives in order to arrest or minimize processes that will otherwise create miserable conditions of life for many future inhabitants of the planet, followed by eventual human extinction. 
the precise character of the choice will differ for people in different societies. The most affluent societies have historically been responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions that are the primary human cause of climate change. And those of us who live in such societies may have to decide how sharply we're willing to reduce our standard of living. By contrast, those who live in less developed societies that hope to achieve affluence as great as ours may instead have to decide to what extent they're willing to forego or delay the gains to which they aspire. But these choices have a common structure. In both affluent and developing societies, decisions must be made about the extent to which those now living are prepared to incur costs and to accept certain forms of hardship so that those who live later don't have to endure much greater hardships and so that human beings can continue to inhabit the Earth. Climate change has attracted the attention of researchers in many different disciplines. Philosophers, in particular, have been especially interested in the issues of justice and responsibility that it raises. How does justice require the costs of preventing or mitigating the worst effects of climate change to be shared among the nations of the world, which differ widely in their wealth, population, developmental level, and historical levels of greenhouse gas emissions? To what extent can the problem of climate change be addressed through the existing system of nation states and international organizations? And to what extent does the need to confront this problem call for the development of new structures of global governance? What would those structures have to look like in order to satisfy the demands of justice? And what are the responsibilities of individuals to modify their own behavior and to mobilize politically in support of efforts to combat climate change? These are all important questions. But there are some prior questions that also need to be addressed. Most fundamentally, there's the question of why we should care about climate change at all. In particular, why should we care about those effects of climate change that will not unfold until after we are gone? Suppose that even if climate change were to proceed unchecked, those of us who are already alive could live out the remainder of our lives without undue hardship. If this were true, would we still have reason to be concerned about those effects of climate change that will be felt only after we're gone and will affect only future generations? And if so, why exactly? In attempting to answer these questions, I think it's important to take seriously the idea that what we are discussing is the fate of future generations. Philosophers sometimes use the phrase future generations interchangeably with the phrase future people. And in some contexts, that bit of usage is perfectly innocent. But the word generations has distinctive content, and the widespread use of the phrase future generations is significant. It testifies to the fact that the people of the future, the people whose existence and flourishing are in question, do not present themselves to us in thought simply as an unstructured group. They present themselves to us as temporally and causally ordered. What is in question is the future of a chronological succession of generations, each produced causally by the one preceding it. When we ask why we should care about future generations, we are not simply asking why we should care whether people exist in the future and how those people fare. We're asking why we should care that the chronological succession of generations, which has delivered each of us here, should extend into the future under more rather than less favorable conditions. The difference between these questions is important. If we ask why we should care about future people, for example, or what our responsibilities toward them are, we may be tempted to suppose that the only thing that's at issue is the weight we give to their interests or their welfare. We may fail to consider the possibility that the importance to us of future generations lies precisely in the fact that they are our successors, that their existence extends the chain of generations in which we ourselves are participants. So just by the way we have framed the question, we may have diverted attention away from an important part of the answer. Yet if that is part of the answer, it's hiding in plain sight, its presence revealed whenever we use the expression future generations. Any answer to the question of why we should care about the effects of climate change on future generations or about the threat it poses of eventual human extinction must draw on ideas of value of the kind I began by discussing. It must draw on some conception of the value or importance of human continuity and survival. 
If what I've said is right, we have no settled and well-developed conception of this kind. We exhibit a kind of temporal parochialism, but most of us are not secure in our parochialism. If we were resolute and unwavering in our parochialism, the question of why we should care about the effects of climate change on future generations might admit of a simple negative answer. If we felt no evaluative ties to anyone but our contemporaries, then we might not have any reason to care about the effects of climate change on our successors, nor even about the possibility of human extinction by the end of this century. But we're not resolute in our parochialism. To some extent, at least, we're preoccupied with our place in the chain of generations despite ourselves. And our very ambivalence evidences a tacit recognition that the fate of our successors implicates values that are important to us. My aim in this lecture is to excavate the sources of our ambivalence. Ultimately, I want to suggest we have richer evaluative resources than we may realize for thinking about the future of humanity, and we have stronger and more varied reasons than we commonly acknowledge for caring about the fate of our successors. Despite the unsettled state of our evaluative thought about the future, Questions about our responsibilities to future generations have been the subject of a large philosophical literature that has grown up over the past several decades. Much of that literature has developed in response to the pioneering work of Derek Parfit in his book, Reasons and Persons. Parfit's work and much of the literature responding to it is of basically utilitarian orientation. It's concerned with trying to formulate a general moral imperative to do good or what utilitarians call a principle of beneficence, that seems credible when applied to questions about people who do not yet exist. The primary question is how, in assessing actions and policies that will affect future generations, we should balance considerations about the number of people who will come to exist against considerations about the quality of life that those who come to exist will enjoy. Such questions are taken to define the emerging field of population ethics as it's called. I myself do not find it helpful to think about the problem of future generations in utilitarian terms, nor do I plan to frame my own discussion with reference to the questions of population ethics. There are several reasons for this. First, I'm interested in the broad topic of how future generations feature in or are related to our practical and evaluative thought as a whole. I'm concerned with questions about what hopes we may have for our successors, about whether and why their survival and flourishing matter to us, and about what reasons we may have for concerning ourselves with their fates. From this perspective, questions about our moral duties or obligations toward them, whether we conceive of such duties in utilitarian or non-utilitarian terms, comprise only a subset of the questions that are worth considering. Values of many different kinds may have roles to play in our reflections about future generations, and they need not all take the form of moral obligations. Moreover, there are costs to a narrow and highly moralized focus on questions of duty and obligation. Such a focus may discourage us from thinking broadly about the kinds of meaning and value that we attach to the continuation of human life on Earth. It may tempt us to suppose, wrongly in my opinion, that future generations matter to us only insofar as they add to our already abundant stock of potentially burdensome obligations. <laughs> Second, even within the territory of moral duty or obligation, an exclusive emphasis on beneficence-based duties and the questions of population ethics seems to me a mistake. For utilitarians, beneficence is the whole of morality. And so for them, an adequate principle of beneficence would give a complete answer to the apparently more general question of what moral responsibilities we have toward future generations. But for non-utilitarians, beneficence is at most one aspect of morality, and it's not clear that we need an unrestricted principle of beneficence of the kind that utilitarians want. Nor is it clear that we should expect all the questions of population ethics to have determinate answers. So if, so if we wish to engage in moral reflection about the future, then unless we're utilitarians, we have good reasons not to limit our reflections to population questions or to the search for a satisfactory principle of beneficence. 
It's also worth remembering that although some of the most familiar versions of utilitarianism do have clear implications for questions of population ethics, the implications they have strike most people as being manifestly unacceptable. Indeed, this is one of the starting points of Parfit's own discussion, and most of the beneficence-based literature is preoccupied with trying to resolve the puzzles that arise if one tries to formulate a principle of beneficence that does not have what are acknowledged to be absurd or repugnant or ridiculous or otherwise unacceptable implications when applied to population questions. Philosophers will recognize that the terms absurd, repugnant, and ridiculous are here function as technical terms introduced by Parfit in his book. Finally, there's a practical difficulty with a purely utilitarian approach, at least insofar as one thinks it would be desirable for people to take more seriously problems like climate change and nuclear proliferation, which pose such grave threats to the lives and well-being of our descendants. From a utilitarian perspective, the moral significance of future generations lies in their status as potential victims or beneficiaries of what we do. But unlike other potential victims and beneficiaries, future generations don't actually exist yet. And this obvious fact poses a serious difficulty from a utilitarian perspective because utilitarianism appeals to sympathy as the primary motive that's supposed to lead people to comply with its norms. If we ask why people should be motivated to maximize the well-being of all human beings or all sentient creatures, as utilitarianism directs them to do, the most common answer within the utilitarian tradition appeals to our capacity for sympathetic identification with others. Many non-utilitarians are skeptical about whether sympathy is in general a sufficiently robust and reliable feature of human psychology to provide a secure basis for moral motivation. Whether or not one shares those general doubts, all sides are agreed that motives like sympathy are most effective in motivating action when we're confronted in a vivid and immediate way with the plight of people who are suffering. In the aftermath of a natural disaster, for example, televised images of human suffering often elicit an outpouring of assistance, whereas more abstract descriptions of human need generate less of a response. But vividness and immediacy are precisely what are lacking when we contemplate the lives of future generations. So whatever one thinks of the motivational credentials of utilitarianism in general, there are specific reasons for pessimism about the capacity of utilitarian reasoning to motivate strong action in behalf of our descendants. This is especially significant because there is no possibility of a genuinely intertemporal politics in which future generations can represent themselves and defend their own interests. Yet any concerted effort to address the problems that threaten future generations will require a politics of some kind. And it's a real question whether the motives that might drive such a politics exist and are sufficiently prevalent and powerful among the living to be efficacious. If such a politics can rely on no motive more powerful than sympathy sustained by the hortatory force of utilitarian moral argument, then I think its prospects are bleak. This gives us practical as well as theoretical reasons for not wanting to restrict ourselves to utilitarian ideas, if we can help it. In fact, I don't think it's true, as utilitarianism encourages us to think, that future generations are nothing more to us than potential beneficiaries or victims of our actions. Even if we no longer accept the traditional narratives that once underwrote people's sense of the continuity among the generations, we remain more invested in the fate of our descendants, and they remain more thoroughly implicated in the structures of value that we rely on in our own lives than we normally recognize. If that's right, then we may have more evaluative resources available for thinking about our relations to them than we normally realize. In the rest of this lecture, I'll develop this suggestion a bit further. I'll attempt to show that quite apart from considerations of beneficence, we have reasons of at least four different kinds for trying to ensure the survival and flourishing of those who come after us. When I say that we have reasons of these kinds, I don't mean that everyone does, only that many people do. For my purposes, the fact that many people have these reasons is sufficient. At a practical level, it expands the collective repertoire of reasons that may be drawn upon when trying to motivate action aimed at ensuring the survival and flourishing of our successors. 
And at a theoretical level, it enriches our understanding of the evaluative resources available to us as we contemplate the significance for us if, of life in the future after we are gone. In developing, in developing my suggestion, I'll draw heavily on the main ideas of my book, Death in the Afterlife. The central theme of that book, as you've already heard, is that our capacity to find value in our activities here and now is more dependent than we realize on the implicit assumption that human life will continue long after we ourselves have died. Many of the activities that we now find it worthwhile to engage in would lose much of their point and would seem to us much less valuable if we thought that human life was about to come to an end. Indeed, my conjecture is that the prospect of humanity's imminent extinction would be viewed by many people as catastrophic, even if it would be accomplished in a way that did not reduce the lifespan of anyone who was already alive. In order to illustrate these ideas, I described a scenario derived from P.D. James's novel, The Children of Men, in which the human race as a whole has become infertile for unknown reasons. No birth has occurred in over 25 years, and the extinction of the human race is imminent as an aging population gradually but steadily fades away. It's no part of this scenario that any living person has to die prematurely. Instead, human beings are simply fading from the scene, week by week, month by month, year by year. How would we react if we found ourselves living under these conditions? My conjecture, which I hope people who think carefully about the question will find plausible, is that most of us would find the prospect of humanity's imminent extinction unbearably depressing. This doesn't mean merely that we would feel sad or unhappy or sorrowful. At least as significant is the fact that many of the activities that we had previously regarded as worthwhile would no longer seem to us as appealing, and some of those activities would seem completely pointless. This means that our capacity to find value in our activities would be seriously eroded. Now, the tendency of this line of thought, it may seem, is to suggest that we have self-interested reasons to ensure humanity's survival. We need future generations to survive in order that we ourselves can live what I call value-laden lives, lives structured by wholehearted engagement in valued activities. If so, then it follows, on this interpretation of the argument, that our reasons for trying to ensure the survival of future generations are self-interested reasons that derive ultimately from our concern for ourselves. In Death in the Afterlife, I tacitly encouraged this interpretation, even though I explicitly disavowed it. I tacitly encouraged it because I maintain that there's a specific sense in which the survival of humanity after our deaths matters more to us than our personal survival. The point was that however terrified we may be at the prospect of our own deaths, the prospect of humanity's imminent extinction would actually do more to undermine our capacity here and now to find value in our activities. This may naturally be taken to mean that the reason we need humanity to survive is in order to fulfill our own interest in leading valuable lives. At the same time, I explicitly disavowed this interpretation. I claimed that the fact that the prospect of humanity's extinction would be so devastating for us reveals some limits to our egoism, because it reveals the extent to which we're dependent on the survival of others, indeed, on the survival of as yet non-existent strangers, in order to find value in our own lives. But without denying the, this point about our dependence on others, some readers have continued to feel that insofar as this line of thought shows that we have reasons for seeking to ensure the survival of humanity, those reasons are nevertheless self-interested ones because they have our, their source in our concern to lead valuable lives ourselves. Humanity's survival matters to us only insofar as our belief in it is a precondition for finding value in our own projects and goals. Yet from the fact that the survival of others matters more to us than our own personal survival in the sense that we depend more on the survival of others in order to lead value-laden lives, it doesn't follow that the survival of others matters to us only or primarily for that reason. It doesn't follow, nor do I believe it's true. If the human race were faced with imminent extinction through, for example, universal infertility, then as I've said, many people would view this as a terrible catastrophe. They would find it emotionally devastating. 
the prospect of humanity's imminent disappearance would lead to widespread grief, gloom, and de depression. The fact that people would react this way shows not that they think humanity's disappearance would be a setback to their interests, but rather that the survival of humanity matters to them in its own right. Indeed, it's precisely because humanity's survival matters to them in its own right that its disappearance would be a setback to their interests. It's true, of course, that the disappearance of humanity would make certain activities pointless, and so it would be instrumentally irrational for people to continue to engage in them. Why try to find a cure for cancer, or to enhance the seismic safety of bridges, or to improve the quality of early childhood education? if there'll be no people around to benefit from one's efforts. Since under present conditions, the people engaged in these activities have an interest in continuing to engage in them, the disappearance of humanity would indeed be a setback to those people's interests. But what's important to notice is this. The fact that people think it antecedently worthwhile to engage in such activities so that their interests eventually become bound up with the success of those activities reveals that what happens to future generations already matters to them. They believe it's worthwhile devoting their lives to activities whose greatest benefits may not be realized until after they're gone. If they didn't believe that, they wouldn't choose to engage in such activities in the first place, and their interests would not come to be defined by them. More generally, many of our activities, whether or not they have the goal-oriented character of cancer research or seismic safety efforts, take for granted the importance to us of future generations. The primary reason why the prospect of humanity's disappearance would be devastating to those engaged in such activities is not that it would make the activities seem pointless. The activities only make sense in the first place on the assumption that future generations matter to us, and it's because their survival matters to us that the prospect of imminent extinction would be devastating. Of course, since the activities would be rendered pointless, and since it is in our interest to engage in worthwhile activities, it follows that we do have an interest in humanity's survival. But that's not the primary reason why we should concern ourselves with humanity's survival. The primary reason is that humanity's survival matters to us in, our, in its own right, whether we recognize it or not. The appeal to our interests presupposes this prior reason. If the survival of human beings did not already matter to us, we would not have the same interest in trying to ensure it. In short, we have an interest in their survival because they matter to us. They do not matter to us because we have an interest in their survival. Granted, this may not be true of everyone. Suppose that my project is to build large monuments to myself solely in order that future generations of human beings will know who I was and think about me from time to time then a belief that humanity will survive is necessary in order for me to find value in my project, and the imminent extinction of the human race would deprive the project of its point. But it's not clear that humanity's survival matters to me in any other way. Just as the self-interested interpretation insists, it matters to me only insofar as it's a precondition for finding value in my project. But this is, I hope you'll agree, an unusual case. For most people who wish to be remembered by future generations, the wish is not simply to be remembered, but to be remembered because one has done something worthy of recognition and admiration. The question then is what activities or accomplishments these people regard as worthy of admiration, and how the perceived worth of those activities and accomplishments would be itself be affected by the imminent extinction of humanity. More importantly, most people who regard their activities as worthwhile do not hope or expect that they will be remembered by future generations at all. Yet many of them would nevertheless feel that their activities were no longer worth pursuing if humanity's disappearance were imminent. The upshot is that, in addition to any reasons of beneficence we may have, we also have reasons of two further kinds to attach significance to the fate of future generations. The first, which we may call reasons of concern, rest on the fact that their fate matters to us in its own right, while the second, which we may call reasons of interest, appeal to our own interest in leading lives engaged in worthwhile activities. These two categories are conceptually independent, but in fact it's only because future generations matter to us in their own right that we have an interest in their survival. 
As I said earlier, there's a lot packed into the thought that the survival of humanity or of future generations matters to us. The idea of future generations is the idea of a succession of overlapping cohorts, each related to its predecessors and successors, both temporally and causally, extending from now into the future. Similarly, the idea of humanity's survival is not just the idea of human beings existing sometime in the future. It's the idea that, for a good long time at least, there will continue to be human beings who are related causally as well as temporally to those who came before them and those who came, come after them. Insofar as future generations matter to us and insofar as we care about the survival of humanity, what matters to us is that the causal and temporal chain of generations should continue. Nor are we concerned solely with humanity's bare survival. Instead, we want human future generations to survive under conditions conducive to their flourishing. Since the chain of generations is constituted ultimately by chains of individual descent, you might think that any concern we have for the former must reduce to a concern for some instances of the latter. You might think, for example, that our concern for future generations consists in a concern that we ourselves should have children, who in turn have children, and so on into the indefinite future. But this is a mistake. Many people do, of course, have an intense desire to have children, and many have a very strong desire to have grandchildren. Some people, though fewer, I think, have a strong desire that their own line of descent should continue indefinitely into the future. But the concern that the chain of human generations should extend into the future is not a concern that some particular line of individual descent should persist. The two desires are not mutually exclusive, of course, but the former does not reduce to the latter. Dismay at the prospect of humanity's imminent extinction would not be limited to those who have or expect to have children. So it's not only those who have or expect to have children to whom the fate of future generations matters. Similarly, the concern for future generations does not consist in or reduce to a concern that one should have an impact on one's successors. Again, Many people do hope to have some positive impact on those who come after them. But the concern for future generations does not reduce to a hope or wish of this kind, still less to a hope or a wish that future generations should survive in order that one may have a positive impact on their lives. Our concern for future generations is at once more straightforward and, more, and apparently more mysterious. It's straightforward because it's simply a concern that the chain of generations should be extended into the indefinite future under conditions conducive to human flourishing. What makes this concern seem mysterious is what I've called our temporal parochialism. Most of us lack any clear or well-developed conception of the value of human continuity or of the values that we hope will be realized in the future nor do we exhibit any normatively articulate understanding of the importance to us of future generations or of our own relations to them. If I'm right, though, our concern for future generations gives the lie to, or at any rate shows the limits of, our temporal parochialism. When in imagination we contemplate the imminent disappearance of the human race, and when we react to that prospect with feelings of loss and sadness and even despair, we make it clear that despite our tendency to overlook the fact, the survival of human beings matters deeply to us. The point can be put more strongly. If we say, following Harry Frankfurt, that love consists in a disinterested concern for the flourishing of what is loved, then in experiencing such reactions, what we reveal is our love of humanity. This may strike some as preposterous. How can we be said to love people whose identities are unknown, who don't yet exist, who may never in fact exist, and who, if they do exist, won't do so until after we're dead? How can it even be said that we're concerned about these non-existent people, or that they matter to us? Surely the indeterminacy of their identities and our uncertainty about whether, whether they will ever exist are incompatible with attitudes like love and concern. But this is a mistake. To be sure, the love of humanity differs from the love of the particular people we know, just as a love of literature differs from the love of one's dog. Love varies as its objects vary. Our love of humanity comprehends a range of attitudes and dispositions. 
These include a deep desire that the chain of human generations should extend into the indefinite future under conditions conducive to human flourishing, and a disposition to emotions like profound sadness at the prospect of humanity's imminent disappearance. None of these desires or dispositions is rendered irrational or inappropriate by our lack of knowledge of the identities of the particular people who will live in the future, or even by uncertainty about whether they will exist at all. The suggestion that we exhibit a love of humanity may seem preposterous for another reason. Even though I've not suggest suggested that this form of love is universal, but only that it's very widespread, it may seem that in order to refute the suggestion, one has only to read the newspaper any newspaper, anywhere in the world, on any day. The ongoing record of human savagery, brutality, and violence is so overwhelming, and these tendencies of human behavior manifest themselves with such depressing frequency and on such a staggering scale that one would have to be mad to, promote, to propose that a love of humanity is a significant feature of human psychology. Yet the reality of the one does not undermine the reality of the other, any more than the prevalence of cruelty undermines the reality of kindness, or the prevalence of greed undermines the reality of generosity. In suggesting that many people would react to the prospect of imminent human distinction with sadness and even despair, and that these attitudes reveal a form of concern that might best be described as a love of humanity, I'm not suggesting that this concern is our only concern or our strongest concern or a concern that coheres smoothly with every other aspect of our psychologies. The complexity of human attitudes and motivations is their most striking feature, which is why every simplifying and reductive theory of human psychology inevitably ends in failure. We human beings are a strange and wondrous and terrible species. Our motives are nothing if not mixed. The love of humanity is simply part of the mix. Some may insist that what I've called reasons of concern, or what we might instead call reasons of love, are themselves self-interested reasons. They're reasons to care about future generations only because future generations matter to us. But this is specious. One might just as well say that our concern for acting in behalf of the particular people we love, or for concerning ourselves with their well-being, are self-interested, since we have such reasons only because these people matter to us. This is a mistake, albeit a common one, for it neglects the, what John Rawls called the distinction between the interests of a self and an interest in oneself. When we're distressed because someone we love has been harmed, the fact that it is we who care about the person does not make our distress self-interested. To say that we're self-interested is to say something about what we take an interest in, namely, ourselves. It is not to say that it is we who take an interest. So we have reasons of at least two different kinds, quite apart from reasons of beneficence, for concerning ourselves with the fate of future generations. Reasons of love and reasons of interest. Reasons of love are rooted in our direct concern for the survival of humanity. Reasons of interest are rooted in the fact that our capacity to lead lives of value here and now would be eroded by the prospect of humanity's imminent disappearance. But our reactions to that prospect reveal reasons of another kind as well. For part of the dismay we feel in contemplating the human race's imminent extinction is a response neither to the defeat of our own interests nor to the fate of the humanity we love, but rather to the destruction of value. There is, I believe, a conservative dimension to human valuing, something approaching a conceptual connection between valuing something and wanting it to be sustained and to persist over time. In general, we're not indifferent to the destruction of things that we value. And part of what is shocking about the prospect of humanity's disappearance is the recognition of how much of what we value will disappear along with the human race. All of the many things we value that consist in or depend on forms of human activity will be lost when human beings become extinct. No more glorious singing or graceful dancing or intimate friendship or thrilling conversation or inspired creativity or gestures of kindness or warm family celebrations. Other things that we value, physical artifacts, for example, will survive for a while, but with no one to appreciate their value 
For in addition to the disappearance of value, the extinction of the human race will mean the disappearance of valuing from the earth. Whether value can survive without valuing, whether it makes sense to speak of the existence of value in a world where there's nobody left to value anything, is a nice question for philosophers. But for the purpose of understanding our reactions to the prospect of humanity's imminent extinction, the answer doesn't much matter. When we contemplate that prospect with horror or dismay, part of what we are registering is the disappearance of vast realms of value, along with the entire known realm of beings with the capacity to appreciate value. And our horror at this prospect points to another reason why the fate of future generations matters to us. It matters to us because, in the respects just mentioned, the future of humanity is the future of value. This means that, in addition to reasons of love and reasons of interest, we have reasons of a third kind, reasons of value, to concern ourselves with the fate of future generations. What's at issue here is neither our direct concern for humanity nor our interest in being able to engage in valued activities during our lifetimes. What's at issue is our desire that the things that we value and the very phenomenon of valuing things should survive into the future. I want now to suggest, finally, that we also have reasons of reciprocity for concerning ourselves with what happens to future generations. How can this possibly be? Our relations to future generations seem much too asymmetrical to count as relations of reciprocity. Those generations are causally dependent on us. We have the power to affect their lives in profound ways. Indeed, we have the power to determine whether they'll live at all. By contrast, we're not causally dependent on them. If and when they come into existence, they will not be able retroactively to inflict harms on us or to provide us with benefits. Yet if what, if I, yet if what I said earlier is correct, it would be a mistake to suppose that we're not dependent on them at all. For our confidence in the value of our current activities implicitly depends on our confidence in their survival. We are, in this sense, evaluatively dependent on them. And we're emotionally dependent on them as well, inasmuch as the prospect of humanity's imminent disappearance would be profoundly distressing to us. This means that there's a distinctive kind of mutual dependence that characterizes our relations with future generations. On the one hand, the quality of their lives and their very existence are causally dependent on what we do. On the other hand, we are evaluatively and emotionally dependent on them and their survival. In view of this mutual dependence, there's room for a certain idea of reciprocity, which I'll call evaluative reciprocity, to govern our relations to future generations. The prospect of their survival is a precondition for, and so contributes to, our being able to lead lives structured by wholehearted engagement in valued activities. In that sense, they enhance our ability to lead good lives now. At the same time, there are many different ways in which we can enhance their ability to lead good lives in the future. But what exactly is meant by saying that the prospect of their survival is a precondition for our being able to lead value-structured lives? There are two sides to this idea. First, it means that our belief in their survival is a causal precondition of our leading such lives. But second, it means that we see their survival itself as providing us with reasons for confidence in the value of our activities. It's the assumed fact of their survival that's taken to be reason-giving, not our belief in that fact. If we knew that they would not survive, then the prospect of taking a pill that would induce in us a false belief in their survival would be small consolation. This is important because the suggestion that an idea of reciprocity applies to our relations to future generations will seem like a non-starter if we assume that in a relationship of reciprocity, the reciprocal contribution of each party to the other must be understood causally. Clearly, generations who exist at some future time cannot make causal contributions to our well-being now. At most, it's the prospect of their existence, which is to say our belief that they will exist, that can make such a causal contribution. However, the idea of evaluative reciprocity as applied to the case of future generations asserts something different. It asserts that on the one hand, we can causally enhance the ability of future generations to lead good and worthwhile lives. But on the other hand, their survival enhances in a different way our ability to lead lives of purpose and value. 
If we thought they would not survive, we would see less reason to engage in many of the activities we now value deeply. So their contribution to us is rational rather than causal. Their future existence provides us with reasons for confidence in the value of our activities. Nevertheless, in view of the asymmetrical causal relations between us and future generations, some will doubt whether what I've described is really a form of reciprocity. They'll want to assert just what I'm denying, namely that in order for talk of reciprocity to be appropriate in this context, future generations would have to make some causal contribution to the quality of our lives. At first glance, this may seem like a mere terminological disagreement, a dispute about how the word reciprocity is to be used. But there's more here at stake than a clash of terminological stipulations. The term reciprocity is appropriate because our relation to future generations is one of genuine mutual dependence, even if the form taken by our dependence on them is different from the form taken by their dependence on us. Each side is dependent on, and so vulnerable to, what the other does or what happens to the other. This makes it appropriate to speak of a relationship of reciprocity between them. This terminology is appropriate for another reason as well. In using the phrase evaluative reciprocity to characterize our relations with future generations, I mean to be suggesting that people who were sensitive to reasons of reciprocity of the usual kind would see reasons of a recognizably similar kind as applying to our relations with future generations, provided they understood the kind of mutual dependence that characterizes those relations. This is not a linguistic point. It does not mean that they would use the word reciprocity to characterize those perceived reasons for action. They might or might not. It means that considerations of evaluative reciprocity would engage the same motivational tendencies in them as considerations of ordinary causal reciprocity. It's this psychological and conceptual conjecture that underlies my use of the term evaluative reciprocity and renders it more than a metaphor or a mere terminological stipulation. So my suggestion is that an idea of evaluative reciprocity governs our relations to future generations and that in consequence we have reasons of reciprocity to try to secure their survival and flourishing. If I'm right, then we have, apart from reasons of beneficence, reasons of at least four additional kinds to concern ourselves with the fate of future generations. Reasons of love, reasons of interest, reasons of value, and reasons of reciprocity. I said at the, as I said at the beginning, I don't suppose that everyone has these reasons, only that many people do. Nor do I claim that these reasons are exhaustive. Perhaps we have reasons of other kinds as well. But reasons of these four kinds belong to our collective repertoire of reasons. They're among the reasons that we the living have for seeking to secure the survival and flourishing of our descendants. Earlier, I called attention to three limitations of the beneficence-based literature on problems of future generations. First, it encourages an overly moralized way of thinking about our relations to our successors and makes it easier to neglect the broader evaluative significance that we attach to human survival and continuity. Second, even within the territory of morality, its preoccupation with duties of beneficence is unduly limiting and leads to a disproportionate emphasis on the issues of population ethics. Third, because of the extent to which beneficence-based duties as understood by those in the utilitarian tradition must rely on sympathy to motivate compliance, it provides little reason for optimism about the practical and political prospects of effective action aimed at securing the survival of future generations. Although I've expressed reservations about the role that a broadly utilitarian principle of beneficence should be expected to play in thinking about our responsibilities toward future generations, I don't mean to say that reasons of beneficence have no role at all. The additional types of reason I've cited complement rather than exclude whatever reasons of beneficence there may be, and reflection on those additional reasons may help to overcome the three limitations of an exclusively beneficence-based approach. First, I have not made any attempt to classify the reasons of I've identified either as moral or as non-moral, nor have I drawn any conclusions couched in the language of moral duty. For the purposes of this discussion, what matters is not whether these reasons are moral or non-moral, but whether they are humanly recognizable and whether their normative force is clear. 
The pertinent point, the point I find illuminating and compelling, is that once we realize how much the future of humanity already matters to us, we can see that we possess reasons of a variety of kinds to help ensure the survival and flourishing of those who come after us. Second, since the reasons I've described are all independent of reasons of beneficence, they have no tendency to narrow the focus of discussion in the way that the beneficence-based literature does. Rather than directing our attention to issues of population ethics in particular, they invite us to reflect in a more open-ended way about how the diverse considerations they exemplify might best be expressed in our actions and in the ways we choose to live. Finally, there remains the question of how practical political solutions might be found to the problem, the problems that threaten future generations. The four reasons I have described do not, of course, answer that question. They do not demonstrate what shape a politics of the future might take. But they do demonstrate that such a politics need not be left wholly at the mercy of the uncertain motivational power of sympathy. The reasons I've described, reasons of love, reasons of interest, reasons of value, and reasons of reciprocity, all have the potential to motivate action aimed at securing the survival and flourishing of future generations. What are needed are effective programs and strategies capable of harnessing these motives. I'm not so foolish as to suppose that it would be easy to create such programs and strategies. But the task is made needlessly difficult if we assume that utilitarian sympathy is the only motive that might be available to sustain them. Once we free ourselves of that assumption, we can see that although the task of constructing an effective politics of the future represents a formidable challenge, there's no shortage of reasons or motives available to support such a politics. Insofar as there is a deficit that must be overcome if we are seriously to address the threats facing future generations, the deficit is as much political as it is motivational. This brings me back to the issues that I raised at the outset. My starting point was the observation that most of us lack a rich set of resources for thinking about the value of human continuity. We don't, have confident, we don't have a confident and normatively articulate understanding of our place in time or of the significance of our relations to people living at other times. The considerations I've been rehearsing do not contradict these observations, but they do help to explain why many people experience the poverty of our evaluative thought about the future as a problem and why they have an inchoate sense that other generations matter to us in ways that we can't easily explain. Of course, the considerations I've been discussing do not by themselves remedy the deficiencies in our evaluative thought to which I've called attention. They don't supply us with a fully developed repertoire of ideas about the significance of our place in the succession of generations. No philosophy lecture could do that. Such ideas would instead have to emerge from and be supported by much wider tendencies of thought in our culture. Who knows whether that will happen? What I've tried to do here is something much more modest. I've tried to show that we should not take our apparent temporal parochialism at face value. We should not suppose that we lack any impulse to find evaluative significance in our relations to our ancestors and descendants, or that we're simply indifferent to the fate of future generations. Even in the absence of a shared understanding of the evaluative significance of our place in time, and despite our depressing record of inaction in the face of climate change and other threats to human survival, the structure of our own values, when considered carefully, turns out to presuppose the importance to us of human continuity and the persistence of human generations into the future. In addition to its potential practical significance, this fact also has implications for our understanding of ourselves and our values. It means that if we want to think further about the importance to us of our place in the chain of generations, the starting point of such reflection, the default setting from which we begin, should not be the assumption of indifference. We already care about our place in time and about the survival of future generations. We just need to allow ourselves to acknowledge that this is so, and then we need to do our best to draw the appropriate practical conclusions. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu.